Good evening and welcome to the Cancer Education Series brought to you by Mercy One and Above and Beyond Cancer. My name is Chris Goodale and I'm the Executive Director of Above and Beyond Cancer. It is my weekly pleasure to give uh, to introduce our the founder of our organization, Dr. Richard Deming, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Deming. Great. Thanks, Chris, and thanks everyone for joining us this evening. And I've been looking forward to this talk for, for quite some time. Uh, our speaker tonight, actually it's my conversation uh, guest tonight, is uh, Howard Krongard. And Howard is in Florida right now, but he um, also makes his home in, up in the D.C. area. Howard, is, and I'm going to tell you his age because that's going to get into the story. Howard is 80 years young and an amazing guy. And Howard and I are supposed to be climbing a mountain in Africa. Uh, Howard is a uh, cancer survivor. He's also an attorney, and he was the former inspector general for the State Department under the Bush administration, and, and a very fit young man who uh, had signed up to do our um, Kilimanjaro journey that we were going to do in the summer of 2020. And because of the pesky little virus, we haven't been able to get that done yet. But over the course of the last year, Howard and I have had a chance to get to know each other. And uh, we're going to talk tonight about um, several things. We're going to talk about uh, living life to the fullest and what it means to be uh, living with cancer. We're going to talk about clinical trials and the importance that clinical trials play in helping to advance cancer and the importance of making sure that everybody in the United States, regardless of uh, color, location, and age, has opportunity to participate in clinical trials. And we're also going to talk about the importance of uh, geriatric assessments in the cancer clinic. So that's just a little bit of a preview, but let me turn it over to you, Howard. Welcome, thank you for being here. Uh, thanks, Dick, it's a pleasure. It's uh, been great to have the experience of getting to know you. I'm sorry we, we aren't even now uh, getting ready to go to Kilimanjaro, but uh, we'll get it done, uh, we will. Um, my, my role in cancer advocacy, my official role, is as the SWAG Cancer Research Network community advocate representing the older adult cancer community. Uh, for those of you who wouldn't necessarily know, the SWAG Cancer Research Network designs and runs clinical trials uh, with the goals of preventing cancer, uh, improving cancer treatment, or enhancing the quality of life for cancer survivors. And as Dick and I have talked about before, I don't use the term cancer survivor. Uh, I don't believe that people actually survive cancer, but rather they live successfully with it. So I refer to myself as a living cancer patient. And uh, uh, SWAG is supported by the National Cancer Institute, and it's part of the nation's oldest and largest cancer research network. Uh, Dick has covered uh, my personal background. I'm a lawyer by training. I've served in both the private sector, including as the general counsel of Deloitte, and in the public sector, as Dick mentioned, as the inspector general of the U.S. Department of State. Because it's going to become relevant uh, when I talk about the need for a positive attitude and physical exertion in cancer treatment, as well as the life ex uh, expectations of different cancer patients, uh, I note, hopefully modestly, uh, that I've been a lifelong athlete. Uh, I've been inducted into the National Lacrosse Hall of Fame, uh, the New York Sports Hall of Fame, and I continue to play lacrosse at age 80 at what at least I consider a high level. Uh, tonight, what I expect to do is to cover basically three areas. Let me summarize them now so you'll know where I'm going and so you can think about questions that you might want to ask. Uh, when we get into the Q&A session that I hope to save a lot of time for, because I really want to talk about what's of interest to the audience here and those who are able to uh, raise questions electronically. First, in my role as community advocate uh, representing the older adult cancer community, I want to emphasize what Dick mentioned, which is the need for more senior participation in clinical trials and research. 
The COVID experience has illustrated for us the disparity that exists in trial and research data due to the difficulties and reluctance in getting increased senior participation. Uh, there are barriers to this participation which exist at the systemic level, at the clinician level, and at the patient level. Second, again, as Dick summarized, I want to talk about the huge variances that exist, especially in older cancer patients, in things such as attitudes, needs, expectations, strengths, cognitive abilities, pain tolerance, genes, bodily responses, nutrition, reactions to drugs, the size, nature, and location of cancer cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point I'm trying to make is that each cancer patient and each case is different and it needs to be considered on its own merits. It therefore becomes critical that especially older patients or their relatives or caregivers on their behalf express themselves to oncologists, their oncologists, and on the other hand, that oncologists make geriatric assessments of older patients so that proper treatment options and choices are made in view of the relevant quality of life expectations, commitments, support systems, and preferences of the individual patient. That will then lead me to the third area of discussion, which will be my own commitment that I believe I share with Dr. Deming to a positive mental attitude and a high level of physical exertion as being integral to cancer treatment. So to start back on the uh, need for more senior participation in clinical trials, as Dick mentioned, uh, cancer is a disease with a higher incidence among older Americans, and yet older Americans are underrepresented in clinical trials. More than half of all cancer diagnoses occur in patients over 65, but trials focused primarily on older adults are few and far between. Some of the reasons, and I won't try and get all of them, but some of the reasons for this situation include the following. What are considered actual or perceived or direct or indirect financial and cost concerns, such as travel to and from the trial sites, uh, to and from appointments with doctors or trial investigators, uh, inadequate insurance and co-pays, fees that may be necessary for caregivers uh, or for housekeepers, uh, all people who make it possible for the patient to attend and do the clinical trials, uh, and of course, lost wages or required days to be taken off. Now, some trials include reimbursements for some costs, but not others. And significant administrative oversight is required to ensure integrity in the system. There's also the concept you might not have heard of because I hadn't, of coercive reimbursement. And it's improper to induce participants in trials through financial benefits or rewards. Um, one thing that occurred to me was, uh, historically, we've paid people in some cases to give blood. Uh, but the giving of blood is a well-known procedure. It's a one-off or it can be repeated. Uh, but the participation in a clinical trial can go on for a long time and for a surveillance period afterwards, it carries with it uh, risks. And um, uh, so we don't wanna have undue influence that would challenge the voluntary nature and the informed consent that participants need to uh, give. And that's both from a legal perspective and a social perspective. I think we've all heard about some historical situations where uh, people were not voluntarily uh, enrolled in trials. So the, those cost barriers can differ depending on the phase of a trial. For example, it could be during the enrollment period, it could be the trial itself, it could be during the data collection, uh, or the continued surveillance of participants that follows. Uh, it can also differ on the type of trial, whether it's a trial for symptom management, 
whether it's a trial exploring a type of treatment uh, or whether it's controlling cancer. And you might be surprised as I was to find that the data is surprisingly sparse analyzing the cost not only of clinical trials, but the direct and indirect uh, cost of cancer itself. Uh, we all know what the uh, physical and mental uh, costs of having cancer are, um, but we don't have a good handle on the direct and indirect costs of that. So efforts to uh, obtain data so as to better understand the cost barriers and how to reduce or reimburse them are currently being undertaken by the National Cancer Institute as well as others. There are also studies that are being done as to whether changes to clinical trials due to COVID-19 uh, restrictions that were in, in place provide opportunities for us to reduce these financial barriers. As I'm sure you're aware, the uh, COVID lockdown, the restrictions limited uh, the ability of uh, patients and trial participants to visit with doctors, to gather in groups, uh, and there was a great deal of emphasis on technological advances, on telemedicine, on communications uh, through uh, digital and electronic means, a greater use of digital testing, uh, remote testing, uh, all things which have reduced the uh, requirements for people to get together at remote locations, uh, which particularly, as Dick mentioned, we want to be sure that we have participants throughout the country, not just in the big cities where there are academic hospitals, where many of the uh, clinical trials may, may be housed. Uh, we want to get out to the entire country. Uh, so the hope is that some of the lessons being learned and the experiences that are being incurred in the COVID period will carry over into the clinical trials in the future. Now, older Americans are also more likely to have comorbidities, uh, a term which you've heard in the COVID period, or they might have organ dysfunctions, or they're more likely to have toxicities to treatments, or generally just to be frail. Uh, and any one of those things can exclude them from the trials, but it also reduces the results that can be extrapolated from the trial. And again, I think Dick mentioned the need, if you're gonna have useful information, it has to cover the whole waterfront of our population. And when you're talking about more than 50% of the cancer patients being over 65, we need to get more people into those trials. Uh, finally, uh, for legal protections and the fairness to participants, we go to great lengths to spell out the risks of trials. Uh, in great detail. I don't know about Des Moines or wherever some of you may be, but I know down here in Florida, if you watch TV, many of the programs are sponsored by uh, big pharma, by drugs, by treatments. And what you tend to see in the advertisement is a person dancing with a partner or enjoying some wonderful outdoor activity while a narrator lists a bunch of risks and adverse effects and things that could result from this particular drug. Uh, and that's the same thing that happens in the uh, accrual process, what we call the application process for participants in clinical trials. There's great effort to spell out in grave detail uh, the risks that are incurred. And I sometimes look at these and I say, my God, uh, who would wanna be a participant and incur those risks unless you're on death's doorstep? Uh, so I think uh, there needs to be a little bit more emphasis placed on the benefits to prospective participants, not just as human guinea pigs in the service of the general public, but in advances that they can gain in their own cancer treatment through being a participant in one of these clinical trials. Now, with regard to the need for geriatric assessments and to evaluate individual cases, we cannot lump all seniors into one group or make assumptions about them. When I was first diagnosed at age 77 with stage 4B metastatic cancer, I felt some of that grouping. Now, admittedly, not every 77 or 80-year-old cancer patient wants to play a contact sport such as lacrosse as I do, but what is important to that patient? Uh, what can be endured by that patient? What physical and mental strengths are present? 
What family or caregiver support is there? These are the kinds of questions that should be addressed in framing a treatment regimen and in establishing a trusting, efficient doctor-patient relationship. So I urge each of you out there, uh, not just seniors, uh, that if or when, regrettably, you or someone you know is diagnosed with cancer, you or people on uh, your or their behalf, feel free. Uh, and by the way, I say on your behalf because patients are not always capable of doing this from the, for themselves. Uh, number one, they may not have the capability anyway. Number two, they're under enormous stress. Uh, they're, they're not thinking about these. So I'm urging uh, you or your people on your behalf to feel free to discuss with your oncologist who you are, uh, what's important to you. Um, what do you, you know, want to get out of uh, this serious situation that you're getting into? And on the other hand, I urge oncologists, uh, Dick, <laughs> you as well, um, say to your patients, tell me about yourself. Ask them to do that. Uh, one oncologist that I spoke to in this process said to me, and I quote, uh, cancer is a tumor-centric world but we need to focus on the host, that is the patient, not just the tumor. And uh, there are also, of course, very differing routes of treatment and during treatment. Uh, the palliative route, of course, uh, differs greatly from the curative route. Finally, uh, as I've uh, said, and as Dick has said, um, I, uh, I, I know that you all are familiar with Dick Deming's enormously positive attitude. Uh, when he himself was a patient following a serious cycling accident, what did Dick do? He persevered on the above and beyond cancer's transformational journey to Mount Everest. Uh, that says a lot. Uh, separately and independently in my case, I've ascribed to both the positive attitude and the extreme or at least severe physical exertion as pillars of my treatment. I think they've served me well uh, and I think they're very important to anyone's uh, successful treatment. I don't wanna make this uh, evening about me. Um, I uh, am happy to get into these details uh, if you think they're relevant and if Dick wants to ask me about them. Uh, but for right now, um, I think I've covered about more than 15 minutes and I wanted to leave a lot of time both for Dick and for you. So I'll come back to whatever personal things you or Dick wants to do, but let me open it up first to Dick. Great. Well, thanks, Howard. Thanks for that uh, great overview. And again, thank you for uh, being here and, and paying it forward, you know, as someone who has gone, is going through cancer, living with cancer, uh, you could choose to just go to your bedroom and get in bed and pull the covers over your head and just get out of the room to only to go to see your doctor, but you are choosing to use your experience, not only to provide wisdom to yourself, but then to use that light of wisdom to help illuminate the path of others. And um, let's go back to, to the beginning and talking about clinical trials. So, um, let me just kind of set the stage a little bit before I ask you some questions. So why do we do clinical trials? Well, uh, the only way we can make advances in cancer care is if we uh, improve on what the treatment already has been. So right now in the United States, there will be 1.6 million individuals this year who will be diagnosed with cancer. 600,000 will die. We have made huge progress in the last 50 years, but there's still progress to be made. How do you make progress? The only way of finding new cancer treatments and knowing that they're better than old cancer treatments is to compare head to head a new treatment with an old treatment. And that's what a clinical trial is. Um, as Howard has pointed out, they, there's lots of oversight and compliance to make sure that the trial is done legitimately with volunteers and informed consent. Because when we're talking about cancer treatment, cancer treatment has risks. 
And uh, when you ask a patient to participate in a clinical trial, you're asking them to participate in a study where we don't know that the experimental arm is better than the conventional arm, and it may actually have some harm to it. So that's the reason we do clinical trials. 85% um, of patients in the United States with cancer are treated in community cancer centers. So uh, 100 years ago, cancer clinical trials were only done in the university setting. So the number of patients that could actually participate were quite limited because you were basically excluding 85% of the population. So the National Cancer Institute now funds cancer research by providing grant opportunities for community cancer centers through cooperative groups like SWAG, which is the Southwest Oncology Group that, that puts together the design of trials but then those of us who uh, take care of patients in community cancer centers actually can participate in the clinical trials by um, enrolling our patients. So it is true that you've got the academic centers that are sort of designing the new drugs, coming up with the design of the treatment, but they want to make sure that it's done in a way that it practically is applicable to those cancer centers that don't have all the bells and whistles of a, commun of, a, of a university cancer center. So through the National Cancer Institute and a program called NCORP, the National Cancer Institute Community Oncology Research Program, we here in Des Moines, Iowa at our Mercy One Cancer Center can offer patients participation in SWOG studies, ECOG studies, NRG, there's a whole alphabet soup of these organizations that are collaboratives of universities that actually design the, the studies, but then patients in the community cancer centers can enroll. Uh, so that's the reason that we do it that way, and it does allow more patients to participate, which allows clinical trials to be done more quickly the results to be known more quickly and the advances to be put into play. Um, we talked about uh, patients um, over the age of uh, 65. Well, we don't even have to set an arbitrary age. So I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1953. Um, Howard is part of the pre-war generation, but we baby boomers, as all of you know, are a big, fat, huge, group of patients that have changed society as we've gone through grade school and high school and entered the workforce and started buying homes. And, and now we are going to have a big influence on Medicare and Social Security. And as Howard pointed out, over half of the cancer diagnosis in the United States are, 60, are individuals 65 and older. So we are going to be filling the, 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 the waiting rooms and the infusion suites of cancer centers. And historically, as Howard said, we haven't included geriatric patients in many of the clinical trials. And guess what? There are going to be a lot of us that fall into that category. And we really need to know, are these new studies, do they, do they, are they appropriate for individuals? Not every person who is old has lots of comorbidities. We've got people like Howard playing lacrosse. But in general, it's fair to say, the older we get, the more likely we are to have kidneys that aren't quite as strong, livers that aren't quite as strong, hearts that are not quite as strong. Are the doses and the, the, the drugs that we're using in treating cancer going to have the same effect? So that's one of the reasons why we want to include uh, geriatric patients in clinical trials. Um, Howard, um, and I haven't asked you this, did you participate in clinical trials is, is in any way, in any part of your ongoing treatment? Uh, no, and if I did, uh, they probably wouldn't have wanted me as a community advocate because we, we want, basically they use the term, people who are naive to the clinical trial process 
so that we can bring fresh perspective, uh, be advocates for the patients. Uh, so no, I didn't, um, but I, I am a uh, participant in something called the Ironman Registry, uh, which is a uh, international attempt to follow cancer patients and to uh, survey them uh, almost monthly or quarterly about how they're feeling, what they're doing, so as to get a continuing impact at what stage do they do well, do they do not so well. Um, and one of the things, um, again, if you want to understand my positive attitude, I, I in some ways don't want to go through this because it sounds cavalier. I don't want to sound brash or cavalier, but this is true. And, and when some of the um, uh, people in the cancer world uh, heard this, because unfortunately repeated, uh, they've come to me to ask for support. And this goes to the positive attitude. When I was first diagnosed, uh, I took my son aside and I said, look, uh, there are going to be good times and there are going to be bad times. You know, I'm very positive now, but there are going to be times, as in fact there were about six weeks later, there were very down times. And I said, your role is going to be, when I go through that downtime, is to remind me of what my attitude is. Uh, so that I don't uh, continue being down. And he said, okay, well, what is it? And he wrote it down in his computer. And basically I said to him, I said, look, uh, these are just a bunch of crummy little cells and I ought to be able to kick their butts. Uh, so, you know, that's brash. I think Dick, you can be brash as well. Uh, but it's the attitude that uh, I wanted to carry into this. This is a 15 round fight. Uh, I'm not gonna win every round, but I wanted to make darn sure the cancer doesn't win any, every round either. Uh, so the positive attitude has to see you through those down times. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's talk some more about attitude. Um, so uh, obviously there are bumps in the road of life. Um, it would be such a bore. Number one, it's impossible. And number two, it would be so miserable to have just a flat life without a single hill or valley. It would be so boring. It's not going to happen. And it's really those bumps in our road of life that, that give us some amplitude, you know, give us uh, the, the excitement. And you can't have a bump without having a valley as well. So a lot of learning, I mean, you don't get to be 80 years old, whether you have cancer or not have cancer, without realizing there are bumps in the road of life. Sometimes they come as a you know, a sports team disappointment. Sometimes they come as a failed marriage. Sometimes they come as a bankruptcy. Sometimes they come as um, a dependency on drugs or alcohol. Sometimes they come and fall out of the sky as a cancer diagnosis. So how do we use a bump in the road of life as a springboard and not a barrier? Howard, think back and, and what would you say comes to mind as maybe the first major bump you had in the road to life? And, and now, you know, you might not think of it as a bump, but, but something either, you know, grade school, high school, early adulthood that you thought, oh, my God, this I can't I don't know if I'm going to be able to surmount this. Well, I, uh, I want to answer it honestly. So that requires uh, delving into very personal things. But um, as a, a young boy, I lost a sibling uh, and that was um, uh, fits every description you've just said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and we get through bumps with help from other people. So when you get over a bump and get on with life and recognize the support you have and, and successfully get over that bump, the more times we get over bumps with the help of other people, we call that resilience. And it's, you know, the bumps don't necessarily give us strength, but they let us find the strength that's already inherent within us. A lot of people talk about, you know, post-traumatic stress, but there's this post-traumatic growth that, that comes from getting over a bump with help. So maybe reflect a little bit on your life and some other bumps that you've gotten over that have given you this resilience that you have. Well, just uh, let me emphasize something you just said, which is really important. Th these bumps don't 
uh, produce the ability to be resilient or to respond to them. It gives you the opportunity. It gives you the challenge. It gives you uh, the desire. Uh, it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't create it. It doesn't give it to you. All oh, the good comes with the bad. Uh, the bad happens and challenges are opened, opportunities are open. Uh, in my case, um, the two, in a sense, did go together. I mean, uh, the loss of someone who was um, uh, older and looked after me and the uh, need of my parents to take care of her uh, made me very independent, uh, made me uh, more self-sufficient. Uh, it made me want to be more like her, and I thought she was brilliant, and she read, and she did things, so I wanted to do the things that she did. So in a sense, uh, that bad did carry with it the opportunity uh, to see good, uh, and I think uh, during my life, I've always uh, believed that uh, the striving is important, as some people say, the journey is important, maybe more important than the starting place or the ending place, uh, so I, I think there's some truth to that. And, and uh, think back, and when was maybe one of the first times that you intentionally put a big bump or mountain in your pathway? I don't know quite how to answer that. I don't want to intentionally put bumps in my road. Uh, I accept them as challenges. Um, today, every day that I go and run, uh, to be an 80-year-old playing a contact sport, I mean, at age 68, which sounds like ages ago, 12 years ago, um, I played in the professional lacrosse league briefly, but I wanted to do it. And I, I believe I'm still known to be the oldest person in American sports to play a contact sport. Uh, so today in order to, um, uh, because my ego is big enough that I don't wanna embarrass myself if I'm playing as I am, I want to do it well. And so I'm putting challenges in my road every day. I go out and run, I work out, I uh, endure that pain in order to uh, accomplish something. Yeah. And I would say, you know, a bump can also look like um, going to law school. I mean, to intentionally, oh gosh, I just got through college and I'm going to go on and get a graduate degree. I mean, that, that, it, that's, a lot of times we don't think of it as a bump, but we think of uh, the, that really is. You have to have some degree of confidence and courage to take on a challenge like that or getting married or <laughs> deciding you're going to uh, uh, run a marathon or that you're going to volunteer um, at the soup kitchen and give your love and compassion to uh, to folks you don't normally come in contact with. I mean, those are all can be bumps that we intentionally put in our pathway. I guess I'm a glutton then because after law school, I also went to Cambridge University in England. So I guess for educational purposes, I'm a glutton. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I guess a masochist, huh? <laughs> you like those bumps. Um, I would say, um, actually, um, particularly in this environment today that unfortunately exists in our country, I had always wanted to do public service. And in my earlier days, because I went to law school and then I went to England and then I needed, I was getting married and I needed to actually get a job, I never got to do public service as a lot of young lawyers do. And so it was always my intention to do public service uh, in the latter part of my career when I would have perhaps more time and financial security. Uh, and throwing myself into um, uh, the inspector general position uh, during the Iraq war at the State Department, which was a highly controversial time, um, I, I created a lot of bumps for myself. Um, so I'm a, a big fan of philosophy and philosophy may be, you know, uh, words of wisdom you get from a cartoon. They may be from ancient philosophers. They may be from um, extreme skiers. Uh, so I sh shared with Howard one of my favorite sayings that, uh, that I ripped off from an extreme skier. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. So kind of encouraging you to reach out and, and reach above and beyond. Why don't you share with us some of your favorite philosophers, whether they're classic philosophers or or 
uh, just sayings or aphorisms that speak to you. And then I'm also going to ask you how you might view your world philosophy at age 80 and compare it to uh, your world philosophy at age 30, if, if, you, if that question means anything to you. Well, yeah, I'll turn it a little bit because, uh, as I say, at 80, playing lacrosse marks 75 years. There's been an article in the lacrosse magazine uh, just this past two weeks about me, but I'm now playing 75 years, and um, lacrosse is a big influence on my life, and a lot of my approaches, my, uh, my little sayings, uh, my guiding lights uh, come through sports and lacrosse, and one thing in particular that... Uh, carried with me. I'm a goalie. And so when I'm training young goalies uh, mentally, I say to them, look, uh, when a shot goes by you, uh, everybody in the stand sees it. It goes up on the scoreboard. There's nothing you can do about it. If you're still thinking about that one, the next shot's going to hit you in the throat. So what you've got to learn to do is to put that adversity, that brief adversity behind you and be thinking of the future. How am I gonna stop the next shot? Not why did that last shot go by me? And I try and carry that over into all walks of life. I've often said uh, that being a pessimist uh, means that bad things hit you twice. Once when you worry about them and once when they actually occur. Uh, so it's, there's no point in worrying about them. Um, and if I can uh, tie this just a little bit uh, to my cancer experience, uh, I do not uh, do old research myself. It's kind of ironic that I'm an advocate and you think I'm in this and I know a lot about it. The fact of the matter is I got in this because as you said at the outset, it was a way of helping others, uh, not necessarily myself. And um, uh, I don't consult Dr. Google. I don't do research. Uh, I don't think a lot about it. I have a marvelous oncologist uh, that I have full faith and confidence in. I put my life in her hands. And I let her do the research and I let her do the decision making. Uh, and so I'm trying to live my life in as normal a fashion as I can. Uh, so I think that ties to my you know, lacrosse and athletic experience, uh, which is to do the very best you can, get the most out of it and, and, and don't obsess about what already happened. Yeah, that's, I mean, philosophically, that's so important for happiness. I mean, we've, a favorite saying I, I like is that the twin thieves of happiness are regrets of yesterday and worry about tomorrow. That if all, that right now, this very second, you and I right here, right now, we have everything we need for perfect bliss this second. It's when we start thinking about regrets and worries that uh, all of that comes into play. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was the, uh, the importance of having a uh, relationship with your, your oncologist. That you uh, have a trusting, caring relationship. You, no matter how bright you are and no matter how many cell phones you have that are looking up all of the facts in the world you can find, you really want an oncologist to be a partner with you for their wisdom, not just the ability to spout off facts. And you mentioned the important, um, uh, you described, um, you know, uh, that it's a taking care of the host. And I would say the same thing that uh, the practice of oncology is not uh, how to kill cancer cells. It's how does a human being take care of another human being, not how does some scientist kill a cancer cell. And that uh, relationship is, is huge. There is a form of medicine that we refer to now. I've been practicing it all my life before I even knew it had a name. And it's called narrative medicine where the first thing you do when you introduce yourself and get to know a patient is you get to know each other as human beings by telling stories, telling your story. So um, that's, a, that's an important part of establishing this understanding, this trust that allows you to then weather the twists and turns and bumps that happen along the road of cancer. 
Yeah. Um, and let me ask you a question. Did you, did you, did you interview different cancer doctors? Have you been with the same cancer doctor the whole time? How long did it take before you knew I trust this doctor has my back. This doctor cares about me as a person. I'm going to put my faith and trust in this, this uncost. Well, again, I'll get into very personal details that I'm going to share. Uh, in my case, I had a developing situation over some six or more years where uh, we never used that term uh, surveillance. What's that called? Um, enhanced surveillance or whatever. Active but, surveillance. Yeah, I, in those days, they didn't have that. But we had seen, you know, increases in my uh, PSA, you know, not spikes, but increases. And we kept an eye on it. I did all kinds of, you know, ultrasound and digital. And, and so I, we were taking care of, but we didn't. One of the things that is kind of interesting, actually, it, in, during that time, you'll probably recall, there was a time when PSA was not looked upon as a good uh, indicator. Uh, some insurers stopped even covering for it. And there are a lot of other uh, excuses for why PSAs might uh, increase. Uh, I think that there were some doctors that looked at me and said, uh, hey, this guy can't be sick. There's got to be another explanation for it. Uh, but in any event, there, there came a time when um, uh, we knew that we had an issue. And um, uh, I was going to be a surgical patient. Uh, and I went to a place you know, where the surgery was uh, premier. Uh, but everything exploded very quickly and we didn't have time. And what happened was I was no longer a surgical patient. I was not a radiology patient because it had exploded to, throughout my body. And so I didn't have a lot of time to select. Uh, there was a, an oncologist that during the time when I was trying to decide between a biopsy and an MRI, uh, because uh, one of the things I didn't mention, but uh, I'm very involved in uh, Native American activities. And I do Native American camps, uh, sports and life skills camp, where I uh, coach lacrosse and work with young Native Americans. And there was, during this time, I was about to go to the Southwest uh, and participate. And I knew if I had a biopsy, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I wanted to have perhaps the MRI, which reversed the normal procedure. Anyway, during the course of this, uh, a friend of mine uh, who was a colorectal surgeon himself, but a prostate cancer patient of an oncologist. I was talking to him about it. He said, well, just call my um, oncologist and run this by her. And I said, well, I'm not even her patient. You know, how is she going to know me or help me? She, he said, don't worry, she'll know. And I called her cold and I put forth a personal situation and she was enormously helpful. Um, so when it came time that I really needed an oncologist and not a surgeon, uh, I immediately went back to her and she was in a major hospital and she's just been marvelous for me. Yeah, yeah. So like a lot of things, you know, there's word of mouth. We, we, we have trusted friends who turn us on to people that they know and you don't have to just sit down at the yellow pages or I'm sorry, there are no yellow pages anymore at, at Google and just sort of try to pick somebody out. But, um, you know, I've always loved the saying that uh, you don't care what people think until you don't care what people know till you know that they care and to make sure you've got that trusting relationship. And some people, um, you know, they just get referred to someone and uh, they, they, they don't always click. And, you know, it's really important in, in a lifelong relationship with an incurable cancer that you've got somebody that you totally trust and that you uh, can use as guidance because no matter how bright you are, you're not going to know everything about the biology and, and of cancer and all the new treatments and, uh, and the importance of your doctor knowing who you are and how you think and what your desires are is, is so crucial. Um, Howard, I think I want to wrap it, go, go back to uh, research a bit um, because that's kind of how we started. And again, um, this is such an important conversation. Um, how do we approach improving uh, cancer treatment and how do we make 
clinical trials more important? Let me just say one thing that is, in, is important to know. Not every community cancer center does clinical trials. One of the things, if, if you are going to a community cancer center that offers clinical trials, you as a patient can rest assured that this is a center that is looking for excellence and quality and continuous quality improvement. So very big um, commitment financially, hours wise and resource wise for a cancer center to be doing clinical trials. And um, going to a cancer center that does clinical trials, even if you don't participate in a clinical trial, can give you a sense of confidence that this is a cancer center that is interested in advancing the profession and doing continuous quality improvement, not just a center that is a business. So um, that, that's an important thing to know about the clinical trials. And Howard, over the last year, you've had a chance to get to know the people at the cooperative group called SWOG, Southwest Oncology Group. And what, sitting in on some of those meetings, uh, what are some of your impressions about what happens in the those clinical trials meetings and what sort of, what does it tell you about those individuals, doctors, nurses, um, scientists that are involved in cancer clinical research? Well, I'm glad you asked me that because <clears throat> I should have pointed out at some uh, part of this. I, I was fortunate in my life. I never had an experience with cancer. I didn't have, my mother had some breast cancer that she survived but I didn't know a lot about cancer. And when I first got involved, I think the American Cancer Society may be the only thing that I knew that existed. And now uh, you tonight have gone through several um, uh, abbreviations and alliterations of uh, letters that uh, uh, point out the advocacy and the fundraising and the research uh, that exists in cancer is enormous. Uh, so the first thing I was struck by was by how many people really are participating in this war, which I'd like to think of it uh, as a war to, uh, to win, uh, to defeat this uh, disease. And what I have seen, uh, and this is interesting, I'm still in my first year and because of um, COVID, I've not met a single person in person. I participate in a Zoom almost every day. Uh, with these people or groups or presentations. And I don't even know which ones are volunteers, which ones are paid, which ones are doing it for professional reasons. I mean, the commitment, the focus, the dedication, it's overwhelming. I mean, in a sense, I feel a little bit out of it uh, only because I know at age 80, you know, there's a limit to the horizon of how long I can do this. My term, for example, is a five-year term and it's generally renewed for a second five year. Now, will I be able to give 10 years to this? I sure hope so. But the point is uh, that these younger people that I see, the brilliance, uh, their willingness to discuss with me. I mean, I've called people out of the blue. Um, you probably know some of them. And I'll say who I am, what my role is. I don't know the first thing about, you know, I've never been in a clinical trial. I'm just trying to help. And I get enormous cooperation. Uh, so I am very impressed. I mean, I've been in national security. I've been in the State Department. I've been in uh, major corporations. I've, I've had a lot of leadership roles. I don't know that I've ever seen such a broad scale commitment to an objective as I've seen in the cancer community. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for, for saying that, and, and it is true, and I think, uh, you know, every profession has that, and we don't always get a chance to see that, just as um, um, the State Department. I'm sure there are, you know, career um, dedicated individuals that do all sorts of things and takes, uh, I have no clue, all of the different types of professional people it takes to do that. And, and just as you, uh, most people don't have an idea what goes on behind the, the, the walls of the National Cancer Institute, you know, the doctors, the nurses, the scientists, the PhDs, but also the receptionists and the typists and the 
patient transporters that are all part of an ongoing mission to help reduce the burden of cancer. Uh, part of that also is uh, lifestyle and prevention. So one thing that you mentioned, um, I also am participating in an American Cancer Society study looking at the influence of lifestyle on developing cancer. So it's a study called CP3, and it's for people who didn't have cancer, who sign up and every uh, couple of years, you answer a very detailed question about uh, smoking, vaping, chewing, diet, exercise, et cetera. Um, the, this, the CP1, the first version of the study was the first study to actually scientifically link cigarette smoking with cancer. And the way you do that scientifically is you do these longitudinal population studies and uh, that is a form of cancer research. It's not a clinical trial, but it's very important. And that's how we learn the risks of, um, of sun exposure, of, of uh, too much fat in the diet, of, of uh, not enough vegetables, not enough exercise. Those all come out of these population studies. So that's another way of doing research. Another form of research that a lot of people don't understand that we're doing is what we call CCDR, which is cancer care delivery research. So we're looking at not just drug A versus drug B, but we're looking at the impact of, for example, out-of-pocket expenses and taking expensive oral and do patients really take all of their medicines or do they skimp and do it every other day to save money? And what's the impact of out-of-pocket expenses on the way that we deliver cancer care in the United States? So cancer research isn't always just about this brand new drug. Some looking at uh, uh, lifestyle measures and sometimes it's looking at um, the impact of the way we deliver cancer care. Um, Howard, I'm going to turn it back over to you for Well, let me first ask Chris if we have any questions from the audience. Not yet, but I, we would sure encourage anyone who has okay. a question to use the question and answer tab at the bottom of their screen. And we have some folks here that are attending live. Questions from the audience here. They're very shy and they all have face masks on, so I can't see their facial expression. Uh, I'm sitting more than six feet away, though. That's why I don't have a mask on. So, Howard, let's turn it over to you for the last word. So uh, final words of uh, wisdom from uh, someone who has lived a big, rich, full life and isn't done yet. Um, what, what are words of wisdom would you have for our audience? Well, I certainly um, want to emphasize the thing we share, which is um, the importance of a positive mental attitude. Uh, and that in our case, fortunately, the physical exertion that we can uh, exercise. But, you know, I've always believed you're not going to get there unless you think you're going to get there and you, you have ways of getting there and, and you're committed to getting there. And that's all positive. Um, good things. Uh, I know <laughs> I played my first round of golf in three years the other day, and um, when some one of my partners um, uh, made it hit a putt short, the putt stopped a couple feet from the hole, and of course, men are always uh, very catty about that, uh, and I said, one of the great philosophers, you asked me who my philosophers were, or Yogi Berra is one of my philosophers, and Yogi was fond of saying, very, very few short putts go in. Uh, if you leave the putt, <laughs> not likely to go in. Uh, so that, again, is a positive attitude kind of way. It at least hit the ball far enough. It may not be straight enough, but at least hit it far enough that it'll get there. Uh, and I think that's a thought, along with um, not thinking about that shot that went in. I think those are things from the sports world that you can follow. 
Oh, great. Well, thank you for the conversation this evening. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for what you're doing with uh, SWAG and being an advocate for clinical trials and for um, especially uh, in the uh, geriatric population. Um, I'm 68 this year and um, I'm there. <laughs> so thank you so much. Great to, with us. Great to have you be on your side. Thanks okay. for this opportunity. Great. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to turn it back over to Chris, who's going to send us off for the evening. Howard, thank you very much. Really insightful and great to hear from you. And uh, uh, wonderful to be introduced to you as well. So this is great. Uh, this will be. This has been recorded this evening and will be part of the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel, as well as on the Mercy One website. You can just search for cancer education series and you can see all of our weekly presentations and and conversations and uh, we're getting lots of good hits on our YouTube channel so we're excited about that for sure so once again Howard thank you very much for participating this evening a wonderful conversation with Dr. Deming we are brought to you I should mention too by the a grant that we received from the Iowa Cancer Consortium so thanks everyone for joining us uh, great to see you, Howard, and we'll look forward to that trip to Africa so we can spend more time together. I Take care, so. everybody. Thanks.